I'm Walter Block. I'm Jody Emery. This is Adam Kokesh. I'm Jeffrey Tucker. I'm Ben Swan. I'm Tom Woods. I'm Peter Schiff. I'm Eric Voorhees. And you're listening to... And you're listening... And you're listening... You're listening... You're listening to... Ed and Ethan. Soak up the awesomeness. to Ed Ethan, the voice of liberty in Canada, coming to you from Saskatoon and the province of Saskatchewan. My intrepid co-host, Ed, joins me, of course, today. Yay, Welcome back. I'm back. Yes. Yeah. It's been Good a while. Times. Good times. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, it's been fun without you, though. I get to mess everything up technically. Um, uh, yeah, it's okay, though. Yeah, what was it? It was uh, the Bitcoin show before last. I basically just ate up like six and a half minutes of dead air. Yeah, <laughs> was I was, I was at work and I was I was listening and I was kind of like, oh no! Yeah, the poor producer on? there, he like freaked out. He was like, what, what's what's wrong? On, like, what's going on? Anyway, all right, you're listening to us. Uh, thankfully, no dead air at the moment. You're listening to us on Liberty Express Radio, LibertyExpressRadio.com, the Liberty Radio Network, Liberty Movement Radio, uh, the Daily Paul Radio Network. For we're open this about guy, that for sure. I can't do the once more to the breach, my friends. That's just stupid. Why do I keep doing that? Uh, it's like. Maybe know. it's be- you know what it is. It's because when you're talking about uh, libertarian philosophy and mm. freedom, it just feels like a constant battle, doesn't it? it I mean, especially if you go on Facebook, that's a mistake. Don't go on Facebook. Yeah, just leave no. Facebook behind. <laughs> it, it, and it's, you know, it, you have these ideas, and then the mainstream has these ideas, and you, mainstream thinks that you have this idea, but your idea is not. It's like way out we're, there. We're all racist baby killers. Yeah. That's what we are. Okay, so hey, listen. Uh, we, and rich it, snobs, too, that. You know, rich white snobs, man, right? I wish. Libertarians. Okay, anyway, we, <laughs> so so we're going to, we, we mentioned at the start of the show, we're going to be talking to Stefan Kinsella. Uh, Stefan Kinsella has been on the show a couple times before, and it's always been a pleasure to have him. He's a patent attorney and libertarian writer in Houston, Texas. Uh, he's the founding and executive director of Libertarian Papers, uh, founder and director of the Center for the Study of Innovative Freedom, that's C4SIF. I'm sure you've seen uh, postings from that around. Uh, founding member of the Property and Freedom Society. Um, I think I've seen him described as a, I'm going to say, reluctant intellectual property attorney. Uh, yeah. So he should be connected yeah, yeah. with us now. Stefan, how's, how's your day going? It's going well, and you could describe me also as... Da. We yeah, lost you. We <laughs> lost you, Stefan. You have to. You have to repeat just how well you're doing and and how we could possibly describe you. <laughs> All right. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. I think my connection is back. I had a. I had a Skype burp. Oh I'm well, you know, Skype burp suck. But okay, let's try that again. Go right, on. Try it again. Sorry. Okay. No, no. We're, we're, I'm not even going to edit any of this out, Ed. This is all okay. being left in. It's part of the character of the show. Okay. So, so <laughs> what's uh, so yeah? What, what's uh, how else could you describe this? Yeah, this reluctant patent attorney. Well, you know, uh, I'm uh, I am in Houston. That does have negative connotations, I guess, because Texas has this uh, reputation. So I, I like to say I'm really from Louisiana. So at least it's the worst state in the nation, but at least it's kind of fun and interesting. So <laughs> I'm a Lu- I'm one of the libertarian uh, libertarians from Louisiana. Put it well, that way. Okay, explain why Texas has that reputation. Because are you referring to the uh, what was it like the Eastern East District Court. Uh, Eastern yeah. District Texas Court, the one that's very friendly to uh, intellectual patent attorney or intellectual patent plaintiffs? Well, yeah, that's my particular beef with Texas. But yeah, I know that we have a reputation for being, uh, you know, guns and yeehaw, uh, and the immigrant, all this kind of stuff. But yeah, from my point of view, uh, it's it's bizarre that close to Houston, up in Marshall, Texas, uh, which is up the road a little bit from where I am, is the worst patent court in the nation. It's a federal district uh, court where all the patent plaintiffs go to sue. To file their lawsuits, and, and so, so there are these little strip centers full of these little empty offices with little <laughs> placards of companies that have just set up a hundred and ten dollar a month <laughs> office so they can claim a presence in Texas, so they can have a pretext of, to file their lawsuit here because under federal, U.S. federal law, under copyright law, it's a national law, so you can sort of choose which federal district in the U.S. to sue in if you want to sue someone for copyright or patent, and especially for patent. Um, the, the district in Marshall, the Eastern District of Texas, is known for giving wildly large and pro-patent, pro-patent plaintiff 
uh, awards. So this is where everyone comes. It's sort of a big grab bag here. <laughs> you, you say the worst in the nation. I would say the worst in the world. But <laughs> well, that's uh, true. That's true. It's the worst in the nation. So therefore, it's the worst in the world because the U.S. is the worst in the world on IP. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I've seen studies that argue that you know the the United States uh, industries that lobby for patent and copyright, Hollywood, pharmaceuticals, um, some software industries, um, the music industry. Um, they are actually benefited by the copyright and patent law, uh, although the country as a whole is not. But in other countries, Canada, European countries, especially you know Asian countries and Africa, etc., they're actually harmed by these laws, which is why the U.S. uses treaties and our heft in the world to strong arm these countries into adopting U.S. style um, IP law, which basically benefits Hollywood and the music industry and the pharmaceutical industry in America. Yeah, last time we had you on, we were talking about the uh, TPP, the Trans Pacific oh, Partnership. Yeah. I don't know, has there been any more leaked info about that, or are we kind of still we're still pretty hush hush? I think because it, it hasn't uh, went through. Went through the yeah, I haven't heard much about it lately, which which bother, which which worries mm. me, makes me know, <laughs> you know. Um, so there's something going on behind the scenes. Uh, I suspect we're still strong arming people. It could be watered down a little bit, like ACTA was, if it passes. Uh, but it's it's going to be another ratcheting up of. Um, of a uh, state power, and right. the, the perverse thing is the you know the, the U.S. Um, says once once we uh, ad- adhere to these agreements, which we force everyone to accede to, we say well we can't modify our copyright law. That would be a uh, uh, that'd be a violation of our international <laughs> obligations. In fact, I was listening uh, uh, this morning to the uh, oral arguments in the Aereo case, which we can talk about if you guys want to. And one of the concerns one of the justices had was whether um, a ruling in Aereo's favor would put the United States in breach of the Berne Convention, which is the big copyright tr- treaty that which, which we, uh, we adhered to in the 1980s, which requires every member state to have certain minimum protections for copyright. So even if the U.S. wanted to reduce our patent terms or copy, sorry, our copyright terms to a certain you know, – to a smaller number closer to what was – in place at the founding of the country, 14 years roughly, instead of 150 years. Hmm. Okay. So. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that in just a moment, but before we do touch on that, before we get too distant from this Houston uh, or the, the Eastern mm-hmm. District Federal Court thing, whatever, mm-hmm. I did mm-hmm. want to ask you, because the impression I've always gotten, you know, being up here in the frozen wastes, my distant, mm-hmm. my perspective mm-hmm. is distant, right? What, is that is that federal court located in a in like a smaller population center? You said it's just kind of up the road yeah. from like. Yeah. So what's okay? What, what kind of can you give me a feel for how big the population is around that court? Because you have corporations that are you know serve hundreds of millions of customers going to that court. Is it really? Is it in the middle of nowhere? Is it in the middle yes. of somewhere? What it yep. is? Yeah, middle. But it's about two, I think a hundred and. 20 miles or so from Houston. So it's the middle, it's Marshall, Texas, in the middle of nowhere. It's a little town. And they haven't, you know, that's where the federal court is located for that huge district. And they acquired a reputation in the last few decades for being pro patent. And now that's their claim to fame, right? So they recruit, they recruit jurors and they are known for um, being very, quote, strong on patent protection, which means very strong on. <laughs> you know, clamping down on innovation, in my view, right? Um, and so that's their claim to fame now. And so they're going to want to keep that up, just like, just like in the U.S., Delaware has acquired a reputation for having really good, um, right, uh, predictable corporate, um, corporate law rules, which is why many corporations incorporate in Delaware just for the predictability. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I, so used to, I used to hear those ads on, on satellite radio all the time was incorporate in Delaware. It's the yes. best state to incorporate. Um, yes. Well, this is hilarious. I'm looking at uh, the population for mm-hmm. Marshall under 25,000 people. That's a small place for this <laughs> for these big corporations oh, to be going. That's it's incredible. crazy. And uh, if, if you look up the reporting by a guy named I think his name is Joe Mullen, M-U-L-L-E-N. He's a great sort of copyright uh, reporter, and he sort of uh, gets the details of what's going on there. They take pictures. They go down these hallways of these little dinky st- strip centers, <laughs> and there's just an empty building with dozens <laughs> of doorways in a in a darkly lit hallway, and they just hang their little sign out and and just say we have an office there. Wow! So you'll you'll see all these patent troll companies have a little shingle 
on a little office um, in a strip center just just to have a presence there wow. so they have a justification to file their lawsuits there. God, I, I guess I shouldn't be laughing. That's like, actually pretty horrible. It's like, what a better expression of state perversion of of the market, hey? Yeah. Like just like, so, how, more, so, how can it be any more plain than that? Well, so to put it in context, when we talk about patent reform, one of the things people say is a patent reform measure would be to change the federal rules of venue. In other words, if you're sued in Marshall and the plaintiff and you really have no contact with Texas, you should be able to move it to another uh, another court in the country um, that is not quite as insanely pro-patent. And that is the level of disagreement – that's the level of argument we have about – <laughs> this is this is labeled radical patent reform wow. is just giving people the right to be sued in their own backyard instead of being sued in, in Marshall, Texas. So if if that is the level of discussion about patent reform, you know that they're foreclosing any real debate about real patent reform, which would be like lowering the term from 17 to five years and or something like that. It's tough. This this we recent you recently Ethan posted something on our Facebook about copyright and uh, mm -hmm. And and usually th it seems like copyright with people they do not understand this complex issue, and they think that people are being harmed, and the government is really there to help you. Right. And this is so uh tough <laughs> because it's such like it's com it's a complex issue if you don't really kind of know and understand uh, where property rights come from. Right. But the average person completely is like yeah copyright is totally legitimate well you look at this case we we can get to this uh i think Aereo or arrow uh this case where so basically what's going on here uh from my understanding is that this company is taking uh broadcast signals from i guess the likes of say cnn or whatever i don't know uh, and and streaming it over the web uh, oh, it's at that charging... website I watch every morning. No, no, it charges a fee, a monthly oh, it membership. Oh, charges a fee. Yeah. Oh, so, I just do it for free. Well, comparable to when people would throw up an antenna or, you know, would subscribe to cable, whatever, right? They're pulling off mm. these signals that mm -hmm. are being broadcast by cable companies. So They're just not asking for permission. Is, is the whole thing? Is that what's going on? Well, it seems on? like they might be violating some copyright. So, Stefan, give us your expert sort of overview of what this case is about. Okay, so to put it in simple terms... Um, uh, and CNN is actually a bad example because CNN okay. was the cable news network that was started on purpose as one of the early cable companies. But there has been a practice uh, starting in the, what, the 40s, 50s in the U.S. of broadcast TV, NBC, CBS, um, ABC. Um, and they broadcast their content over the airwaves. Now, nowadays, most people get cable, so they – um, they get even the broadcast channels plus the cable channels over their cable provider. The cable pro provider has to pay some kind of license fee to broadcast to, – to transmit to you the CBS, NBC, ABC signals. Hmm. But if you wanted to um, – and this is under U.S. federal copyright law since the 1970s. If you wanted to just have an antenna on your roof, you could receive – PBS, ABC, NBC, and maybe Fox, some, some of these broadcast stations. And under Supreme Court decisions uh, in the U.S. under copyright law in the last couple of decades, it's become clear that this sort of private right you have to receive the information being sent over the airwaves and to record it and to time shift it, okay, under the Sony decisions and other decisions, um, you have these private sort of rights. So what Aereo did was they were very creatively tried to comply precisely with the decisions that had been given out to date. So what they said was, we know that if we just have a big antenna and we, and we just record everything that's broadcast and we, we send it to people, we're going to be a cable company or we're going to be subject to licensing and royalties and all that. But so instead what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to provide a service to users to let them do what they could do privately in their own homes remotely. So they basically, instead of having a big antenna, they have thousands of dime-sized antennas, and they lease one to every customer, and then they lease space in their DVR farm, basically, um, up in the cloud. The right, so you can go onto your uh, Aereo account, and you can say, I live in Boston. 
and I would like to record the following broadcast signal that's being broadcast in Boston, which I would have the right to do at home, mm -hmm. and record it on my own leased space in the memory of um, Aereo's server farm, and then I can play it on demand. So Aereo's argument is that all they're doing is extending the length of the wire ah. from, 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 from your DVR and your antenna in your home to a remote antenna and a remote DVR space at Aereo. So Aereo is uh, just you know renting you the equipment to let you do what you could do legally under the law already. So they're, they're trying to work around the rest restrictions in copyright law. And in the Supreme Court uh, argument, you know, they use terms like Aereo is circumventing copyright law, which really means <laughs> Aereo is complying with copyright right. law. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, 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 it's hard to predict what the court will do. The court just heard arguments last week in the U.S. This is going to be a monumental copyright case in the U.S., kind of like the Sony and the Betamax and the uh, Cablevision cases in the recent decades. Um, if they decide against Aereo, it could jeopardize the entire industry of cloud-based services and cloud locker storage services like, like say, like, say Dropbox and oh, companies wow. like that. Because hmm. you could characterize what they're doing as a public performance too. Um, and it could be a, a, a violation of copyright law. The court, most of the justices on the court seemed very concerned that a ruling in favor of or against Aereo would 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 jeopardize the uh, th this high tech cloud based industry. So my suspicion is they will either roll against Aereo, but in a narrow way, and they will carve out an exception for cloud based locker services. <laughs> but since that is almost hard, th that's very difficult to do. I think they're going to rule in favor of Aereo, and whether they make it narrow or not, I don't know. But if they rule in favor of Aereo, it's really good. It will it will basically um, start forcing the um, the content providers to get with the 21st century and stop relying mm -hmm. upon 20th century uh, distribution models. Right. Okay. Well, so it'll be good in this instance. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I've never been a fan of courts, but uh, that are monopolized. But whatever. So, but the but if they rule against, so okay, if they rule against Aero or whatever, however you pronounce that. So basically, Aero. It's Aero. Aero. Okay. I'll just think Not of Aero like the uh, Taco Bar. That's what I was. That's I know. Like Aero. Yeah. So you got to you like, know, like incorporate think, the think, cookies. Uh, you think Areopagitica. <laughs> no. Just, just take, <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> anyway, so but if they if they if they rule against, you're basically saying that any 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 uh, service like Dropbox that we're familiar with now will essentially have a right of exclusion in regards to the competition, right? So they can basically say, you know, they'll carve out this niche for services like that. Uh, and then anybody, any new market entrant that wants to get in on the on that sort of game. So you look at, uh, for instance, right now you look at decentralized services that are um, <clears throat> that are promising to uh, provide Dropbox like services through something like the Bitcoin protocol. Um, mm. That could be exposing people everywhere to incredible legal liabilities if this court rules against Aereo. Yes, and so uh, we're seeing little glimmers of this already about what could happen if Aereo loses. Um, just the other day, some, some, some Dropbox user posted a screenshot of what happened when he tried to share a file privately with some other, some other friend of his or whatever. Mm. And before he posted – when he sent the link to someone, Dropbox had apparently done a scan of his file – of the hashtag of the file, and they had detected that there was copyrighted material in the file, and they sent him a little warning, we can't let you share this file unless you, you know, show that it's not a violation of copyright. So it was a private use of his own private space on Dropbox, and he was just trying to privately share it with someone, which is what people use Dropbox for quite often, is right. to share large files. Mm -hmm. So obviously I'm not blaming Dropbox. Dropbox is doing this because of a concern that they're going to be secondarily liable yeah. for a possible copyright infringement of their users uh, and that is because of copyright law in the first place and because uh, copyright law in the US at least has these safe harbors if you do certain things if you act in a certain way if you respond to DMCA takedown notices for example like on YouTube then you're you're immune from liability so that is why these companies um, overreact and they become um, 
overly sensorial just to get the safe harbor. So because mm -hmm. of fear of liability of copyright law, companies will become very conservative. And so my prediction is that if this continues, what's going to happen is two things. Uh, customers, let's say in the West, in the U.S., they will just start using companies in Europe or in Africa or in Asia. They'll just start using fly-by-night companies or companies outside of the West or the outside of the U.S. Mm -hmm. So it's going to kill Dropbox, but Dropbox uh, New Zealand might crop up or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Or Dropbox uh, 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 Senegal. I don't know. Um, and then encryption is going to be on the rise too. So ah. if you start encrypting your files privately, then the hashtag system – these companies want to use can't work and they can throw their hands up and say, well, we tried, but we can't Whoa. see what these, these customers have. Yeah, what's that guy, the, the mega guy? What's yeah, that? Kim.com. Kim, Kim Kim. Yeah. yeah. He's, I think uh, his new, the, the government came in, you know, I watched a vice documentary about that. They like stormed his house, like <laughs> full on choppers and yeah, like SWAT totally raid <laughs> type thing. And then like, it was funny. Like they took, the, it took everything. And then like the next day he put something up. If it was like ten times better and all encrypted, it was like just hilarious. Yeah, well, the government I, yeah. Was so funny. I have some reservations about Kim dot com and and his approach to all of this stuff. I you know, statists gonna state, but anyway, <laughs> when you uh, when when you look at this, I'm concerned a lot more about these legal liabilities that people could be exposed to. Because Stefan, you, you mentioned that people could you know start using you know fly by night companies in whatever country jurisdiction. I look at you know the foreign exchange market and foreign exchange brokers. Um, and the, the situation there is that uh, American regulation has basically extended its tentacles across the world to, uh, to, to make it so that if any foreign exchange broker wishes to be licensed with their local uh, authorities, That's right, they yeah. also have to exclude American customers. So the only way that uh, you can, you can uh, accept American customers if you're a company in, say, Finland – is to not be registered with Finland's Financial Services Authority, right? So, yes. so in other words, I'm 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 looking at this as more as more serious than just using fly-by-night companies. I'm looking at this as maybe potentially uh, constricting that competition globally, like just taking all of that opportunity for using cloud-based storage systems or, and the like, yeah. and just completely making it inaccessible to most Americans in particular. Well, I agree completely. Um, look, the, the, the dilemma that we Westerners that are libertarians have is that we, we recognize, like a lot of libertarians do, that there was something especially libertarian-ish about the early American experiment. So there's this connection between the United States of America and libertarianism. And so we're reluctant to acknowledge or to admit that in a way America has become the worst imperialist power on the earth. It shouldn't really su surprise us that the the country with the most liberal sort of early heritage and the biggest economy because we're large, so we be we became rich because of our libertarian or liberal internal laws. Mm -hmm. It's no surprise that the country that has that status will have a government that's going to be the richest in the world as well because it parasite parasitically you know survives off of the wealth of the country yep. on the internal. It's going to become externally the most militant and imperialistic country. So um, um, it's hard for us to accept that – to condemn the country. We, I think we have to separate out the libertarian heritage of some of our thinkers and our traditions from the state that arises from this wealth and parasites off of this wealth. So um, one, let me give one, one example. The United States um, in the, I think, 1970s enacted this uh, law – the um, the uh, which prevents uh, which makes it illegal under U.S. law for American companies to bribe foreign foreign governments. Um, it's called the FCPA, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Okay, and and they're they're saying it's, you can go to jail if you're an American company and you bribe a foreign government to get regulations or you know, mm -hmm. permits or whatever. Now, in other countries at the time, that was regular practice and you could even deduct it from your taxes as a business <laughs> expense. And, okay. okay. And so you the US passes this law and it puts American companies at a at a relative disadvantage to other companies because they're in the practice of bribing when they need to bribe they need to grease the wheels to get projects done in Saudi Arabia or whatever. Um and so of course because of this uh this uh, this uh 
this cost that's being imposed upon American companies, the solution is not to get rid of the law to Mm -hmm. remove the cost, but it's to spread this cost worldwide. So the (laughs) United States in the last 15, 20 years Hmm. has caused the uh, OECD to uh, enact a treaty on anti-bribery which about 40, 42 countries, the, the, you know, the, the biggest ones, have signed on to already, which basically imposes on all these con- countries similar anti-bribery protections. So it's like if we're going to hobble American businessmen, let's hobble everyone else so that their Americans are not at a competitive disadvantage. Wow. So, th- so, <laughs> so I, I, I suspect Canada is part of this too because yeah. – you know, you guys do what we say, usually. 51st state. <laughs> We're 51st state. That's pretty much it. It's true. It's true. That's pretty much how it is. You know, so, all- so that's an example. The, another example would be American tax law, American antitrust law, uh, American environmental law. All these things are applied extraterritori- extraterritorially, unlike the way other countries do it. I mean, America is incredibly imperialistic in, their, in the reach of their um, tax law. Sure. Anti-bribery law and, uh, and antitrust law, things like that. And yeah. I- IP law, of course, too. IP law is, is another thing we yeah, explore to the rest. It's sickening how it spreads. Hey, listen, Stefan, we're just at the end of the segment. Can we keep you for kind of an after show uh, on uh, – you can download it at edneathan.com. Would that be okay, uh, Stefan? Let's do it. Okay, cool. So we'll be back right after the music. If you're on our RSS feed, you're watching on the YouTubes, whatever – uh, Stefan Kinsella, you can find writing from Stefan Kinsella at c4sif.org. That's the Center for Study of Innovative Freedom. Again, that's c4sif.org. Or you can just go to his personal website. You can also do that to stephankinsella.com. That's S T E P H A N K I N S E L L A.com. In the meantime, thank you very much for listening to us here, right here on Liberty Express Radio. It's been a pleasure as, if, as it is every week. Edneathan.com, if you want to check us out. Uh, yeah, I'm not forgetting anything. This is Ed and Ethan. Um, all right, so after show, we are kicking back a bit, you know, we do the after show thing. All right, so, so Stefan, um, to, there are some other, there are some other things I want to touch on here too, but yeah, I mean, this is, this is something that I think is really important to understand is just, it's, I don't know why, why does, why does America have this reason? It's in the constitution. (laughs) That's, that's, that's where I was going to go with it. Like, since, really? since, uh, well, it isn't intellectual property or copyright. But, isn't that in the Constitution? It's like one, like wasn't it, when it put in there initially too? I don't know. We have to ask Obama. He's the constitutional scholar, <laughs> but we don't have him. We don't have him on the line though. So, <laughs> so <laughs> Stefan, <laughs> what? Oh, yeah, I'm not sure. Oh, a scholar I, uh, of which constitu- <laughs> a scholar of which Constitution? I'm not sure. But anyway, we. I, so Stefan. Uh, what, 1984 book, maybe. <laughs> is, is, con, is, is intellectual property in the Constitution? I don't know if we've asked you this before. Is, is there a provision in the Constitution anywhere for intellectual property rights? Yes. So the U.S. Constitution uh, enacted 17, uh, ratified 1789. There is a provision that uh, permits Congress to enact um, copyright and patent law. Now, uh, if you read this, the clause, they use the word sciences to promote the sciences and the arts. So it says the Congress can, can doesn't have to, can provide uh, basically monopoly protection for, for the works of, author, of, of science and the arts. Uh, the interesting thing is that um, the wording is reversed to what we would use now. When they said science, they meant the arts. Well, the, when they said science, they meant copyright because – Science was the, the the knowledge of the of the, of the mind, right? Conscience, right? The word conscience or okay. science, um, and mm. the arts meant um, the arts actually meant practical gizmos, like the like think of the word artisan. Hmm. So it was actually reversed to what most people think of nowadays. So when they said you can protect the, the products of science and the arts, they meant copyright and patent. Okay, that's. I that's weird because I don't, yeah I don't know that's so the, so the, the definite... I got a phone call. Are we back now? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. We didn't even notice. Uh... <laughs> okay, sorry, my phone just rang. Um, so yeah, so so seventeen eighty nine. Now I have an argument that in seventeen ninety one, right? So the Constitution was enacted in seventeen eighty nine with no Bill of Rights, but there was a promise of a Bill of Rights in seventeen ninety one. Two years later, the Bill of Rights was finally enacted. The first twelve. 
sort of the first ten amendments to the Constitution. There were two others that were tabled, and one. By the way, the first amendment. So the first amendment we think of right now is the freedom of speech. Mm-hmm. Was originally a third amendment proposed. The first and the second amendments um, were were not enacted. Or they were not ratified. So, uh, hmm. our, amendments three through through twelve were ratified, and they became one through ten. And in in 1991 or 1995 or something like just two decades ago, finally the the final state ratified the first original amendment, which had to do with wow. uh, congressional pay during during their term in office, and that became the 27th amendment to the Constitution. So the 27th amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which is the last one that's ever been ratified, probably the last one that ever will be ratified, um, was the original first amendment to the Constitution. Um, but in any case, my argument is that the Bill of Rights had freedom of speech. It had protection against uh, warrantless uh, searches of homes. Mm-hmm. It had protection uh, of due process in the Fifth Amendment. It had uh, an, uh, a prohibition upon excessive fines in the Eighth Amendment, cruel and unusual punishment and excessive fines. Oh, so vague. And <laughs> I believe that every one of those is violated by copyright and patent law, especially copyright law. So my, arg- my view is that the Bill of Rights basically overturned the grant of patent and copyright power, especially copyright power, in the 1789 Constitution. So I believe that the entire federal patent and copyright law edifice we have is unconstitutional because of the Bill of Rights. But okay. of, course, the, of course, don't see it that way. Well, why, why would you say specific? Like, what, what in the Bill of Rights overturned copyright? So Explain the, the so, process. So, Okay, so the Bill of Rights guarantees freedom of speech, freedom of press, uh-huh. due process of law, uh, and it bans uh, excessive fines. Now, the copyright law has mm. like $75,000 or something like that per, per copyright breach, which is why you can have some housewife like Jamie Thomas um, sued for millions of dollars for uploading a dozen songs to the internet. And that's clearly disproportionate punishment and uh, uh, it, it, the, the penalty has nothing to do with the crime or the damages caused. Mm-hmm, so right. I think it violates the Eighth Amendment. Uh, the courts explicitly recognize that there's a – they call it a tension, a tension between copyright law and freedom of speech or freedom of the press because copyright law says you can't publish certain things. You can't say certain things in certain ways. So normally that would be um, just unconstitutional because of the First Amendment. But what the court says is that we have to balance these things. Well, we have one we have one part of the Constitution that says that we can have a copyright law, but we have another part that says that we can um, we have freedom of speech and freedom of the press. Um, so we have to balance them out, and we have to find uh, the balance. And so they do this balancing act, and they let they allow some copyright law but not others, et cetera. <laughs> but the problem with that reasoning is that the 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 First Amendment was enacted in 1791. And the copyright clause was 1789. So if there's a conflict, the later provision yeah. should govern. You uh-huh. shouldn't balance them out. Just like the U.S. banned alcohol right in the early 20th, 20th century, and then we later repealed it. Now, the reason alcohol prohibition is repealed is because the repealing amendment came after. So mm-hmm. in legislation and in constitutional mm-hmm. enactment, the later statute, the later provision always – is the is the one that governs. I mean, that's why you can override a, 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 a statute by a later provision. So that's the main argument. I think that um, even in the U.S., the uh, the copyright law is clearly unconstitutional because it violates the Bill of Rights. Okay, that's actually really interesting. I hadn't, you know, because I, yeah. unlike Obama, I am not a constitutional <laughs> scholar, so I, right. you know, I don't, I don't have this perspective. That's actually pretty cool, because I, I don't know, when it comes to the Constitution, you know, Ed did mention something about, oh, it's also vague, and that's true. I mean, when I look at all of this stuff, it's an interesting sort of, I almost want to say, like, it's it's mental masturbation in a sense, mm-hmm. like, you're, right, 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 right. But it, and and it is so vague, you know. I I, I hear uh, sometimes on on Liberty Express, I hear um, oh darn it, what's Chris her Ann name? Hall. Chris Ann Hall. Yeah. She's she's a constitutional expert, and she talks a lot about the Constitution. But you know, whenever I hear words like unreasonable search and seizure, yep, yep, yep. Well, yep. you know, that's not that, that's not to me. That's not really a natural law. That is that is a 
kind of a uh, you know uh, advancing in the game of guesswork. Mm. Right? <laughs> it's, it's just kind of <laughs> we have a law and it might apply and it might not. We'll we'll figure it out. And and it, and, and in the end, we're going to do it in a really uncompetitive fashion because we're going to monopolize the system that figures it out for you. Mm. So you know, it, it's all very interesting. I guess to me, it just boils down quite simply, and I, I would suspect, of course, it's the same for you, Steph. And it, it boils down pretty simply, right, to natural rights. Um, I know that you understand, even with your 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 legal mind and, and your understanding of all of these laws and how they interact with one another, I, I know that you understand certainly that this is all it's it's pretty much make believe, right? <laughs> so. <laughs> The way I look at it is this. Um, these traditional protections you're talking about um, do evolve over time. Le- mm-hmm. legal, legal understanding of rights and the relationship of powers do evolve over time. And I agree that there is a vagueness, there's an ambiguity, there's a lack of precision and rigor in these statements like um, reasonableness. But to me, that's not the, the main issue at least it's the idea there that there's a limit to what the sovereign can do. Mm. Um, the, mm. the main problem with today's legal system is not the ambiguity, which is inherent in verbal reasoning and verbal statements of, 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 of these ideas. The main problem is that law is conceived of as being the emission or the, the statement of some body that can just announce what the law is, which is the legislature or the sovereign. Right. It is what we call in law legal positivism. Um, in older times, the idea of law was we are trying to discern a body of normative law that governs human interpersonal relationships. It's not an exact science like physics is or chemistry, but at least we're trying to find the basic rules that should govern human behavior. It may be imprecise. We may make a mistake. But at least that's what – we're trying to do justice. We're trying to find yeah. the right way people should live among each other. But the modern conception of law is whatever the government body that is tasked with announcing law announces as law. So if they say here's the law in a written document like the Constitution or in a statute, then the job of the courts becomes not to do justice between parties before them. So in the olden conception of things, in the libertarian idea of um, some kind of reasonable dis- settlement of disputes, right? you go before a neutral arbitrator or a judge or a court, and you say A has this case, B has this case, and the, the, the court or the tribunal tries to do justice between them, and they try to find the right result. They're trying to do justice. Hmm. The job of modern courts is simply to interpret words written down on paper. In other words, if the copyright statute says, well, if you have a, quote, public performance, unquote, then royalties are owed and you can't do such and such. So then the job of the court, which is the case in the Aereo case we discussed earlier, the job of the court is simply to interpret words, which may have nothing to do with justice or may be contrary to justice. Mm. So their only job is to say, what does the word public performance mean? Has nothing to do with justice. So to my mind, this is the hmm. problem with the modern conception of law. And if you ask the regular person on the street, I, I'm afraid that their conception of justice has been corrupted and distorted because of the, uh, the government domination of this field. If you say, what is a law? They're, in their mind, they're thinking of a piece of paper with something written on it like a statute that the government enacted. Right. That's, what they th- that's what they think law is nowadays. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But people didn't used to think of law as that. So I'm afraid we've become servile and docile and subservient mm. to the government um, just telling us what the rules should be. Um, yeah, I wonder how, so how that, that happened. That's one mm. of my concerns. Well, yeah, but that's – see, that's why I look at this as a problem of monopolized, centralized structures well, of law. I just want to – I thought – I'm just trying to – I can't remember the name, but isn't there like two parts of like the, I, I – I'm not gonna screw this up. How to describe this? Because yeah, so like law that is uh, specific, like the person is being attacked, and then law where it's specific the government is being attacked. So like I can't remember the term. It's like it's some Latin term they use. Do, do you do you under 
Do you kind of work? Can, <laughs> you, help Can you help me out, Steph? Can you help me out? I'm searching. I'm searching my law school Latin memory for this, <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm not. I'm. Um, I'm not following this. Uh, no. <laughs> okay. Although yeah. I'm happy to attack the government and not the, not the person. <laughs> well. Well, in the law, there's in rem versus in personam, but that just distinguishes between contractual rights and property rights. Hmm. So I don't know. Um, it, it's something like um, you're harming the government, uh, and then which is it, I think it's totally it's total it's total nonsense. Well, it's, maybe you're thinking of an offense against the state, something like that. Something like that, yeah. Well, I mean that that is sort of the distinction, right? We have in today's law of a public crime mm-hmm. versus a tort. So. Uh, uh, Most yeah, liber- yeah, yeah, that's what, yeah, that's where, so, that's where it's going from. Like, you have the, the essentially private justice, where you have uh, individuals are using um, what's it called uh, the arbitration, mm-hmm. and, and they're not using the court system. They actually use the court system to threaten other people cause, to take them to court because it costs so much money. But you have you have the two sets of of different. Ah, I want to. I can't remember this. I remember Michael Dean was talking about this, and they were talking. He was talking about. Uh, copyright in this specific uh, example, and he was hmm. saying that copyright is essentially the government law, and it doesn't really. There's no person that is being harmed. It's it's the perception of a person because that whole corporation thing too. Right. So in private in private law, and private law could be both contractual and property rights, or it could be a tort based thing. But it's always one party, one private party versus another. So that's private law. Um, so to, in today's law, we, we view a criminal or a criminal – someone who violates a criminal statute as basically committing a breach of the peace or they're committing a crime against the state, mm-hmm. which, which is one reason I've always been confused by all these TV shows and novels that, 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 that show that in a criminal proceeding, the government prosecutor goes to the victim and says, do you want to press charges or not? Because – it's not like the victim is the is the defendant or the plaintiff in the case. Or, sorry, the plaintiff. Um, so I've never quite understood that. I think they're mixing together two things because the government can prosecute someone even if the victim doesn't want them to, mm-hmm. right? Because they're not the plaintiff in the case. So the idea is that a crime is a crime against the peace or the public or the state. Um, whereas the libertarian conception is that that there's always a victim, and in fact, if you if you require any trial or any proceeding to always be by a victim who's the plaintiff against a particular named uh, def- uh, offender, the, the malfeasor, then it would limit the scope of a lot of the law we have now. You mm-hmm. wouldn't be able to have a drug crime or an anti pornography law mm-hmm. or a tax law because there's there's no identifiable plaintiff who has actually been aggressed against. Um, by the defendant, which is why the government likes to have this general notion of crime, which is a violation of whatever rules the state decrees. So they they disconnected a victim. So they've taken out the requirement that there that there be a victim mm-hmm. who's been harmed. Mm-hmm. Um, so in a private law system, of course, there would have to be a victim who's identifiable, and they would be the plaintiff, and it would basically be a tort case. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. You know, it's so tough because all these, uh, it's such a um, a mishmash and it's all just thrown together and they just, they never repeal any laws. They just add <laughs> new ones Rarely. to it. So, like, how do you ever, do you ever see this being solved other than, like, like everybody, like, everything gets bombed? <laughs> the government <laughs> just, 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 just destroy <laughs> everything? <laughs> like, I don't know, man. This is this is so tough. What do you, what do you think? I, 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 well, okay, so... I think that that, of course, is um, – <laughs> that is, of course, not at the present time um, uh, conceivable that mm-hmm. we're going to defeat the government by armed revolution. Whether it's legitimate or not is another question, um, but it's just not practical right now. The mm-hmm. government far out, out arms us. Um, well, hold on. I mean, the, the, Well, I guess in a sense that's true, but I mean if you just look at gun ownership levels, you, you, the citizenry is in fact in, in possession of far more firearms, you know, rifles, handguns, and the like, 
than government. It's just they don't have as many tanks and nukes. I get, so there is a bit of an imbalance. I'll, I'll, well, I'll, yeah, I'll take yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, there, there's tanks and nukes. I mean, there, there's that, right? <laughs> yeah, just that, I guess, you know, like, that does come up. Like what I'm, th- what I'm thinking of is like what happened in Egypt where the, the people just rose up and then they just storm into the government buildings and then like took took all the documents from like the secret police and stuff like that. <laughs> like if if we storm into the copyright buildings and just take all the law stuff and get rid of all the files, then the, the, no one's going to know then, you know. <laughs> but I don't know. Yeah, well, uh, well let, let me ask you guys a question. Isn't there some kind of bizarre regulation in Canada about what they call long guns or something? Don't oh, they call yes. rifles long guns or something? Yes, long we have the long registry. gun registry. Yeah. yeah. It's, <laughs> it's so absurd to own a handgun, you have to be actually a member of a range. And you, and and you have to before you go to the range, you have to submit a route from your house to the range to the government, to, and you have to let them know when you're going to use that. Yeah, don't and if deviate. you don't, that's illegal, and you're a criminal. <laughs> it's incredible. Yeah, every, everyone thinks America is a weird country because we have this kind of weird mishmash of traditions and ideas. But Canada is weird because you sort of have the American free spirit, but you <laughs> go with. European socialist controls, yeah. like in a docile way, it's weird. Like socialized medicine, <laughs> guns. It's 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 just bizarre. It is kind of bizarre. It is more of an English uh, over overlord sense. That's for sure. Well, yeah, we we are still attached to the royalty and and constitutional uh, monarchy is uh, that's right. That's our, our that's our yeah. government structure. We, we you know we we have. <laughs> Man, that's creepy <laughs> saying that. You know. Oh well, <laughs> wow. I mean, you know, Canada's kind of built on on a on a on a history of having this sort of connection to uh, monarchies and and having you know people being granted rights and lordships and you know kind of you know these fiefdoms existed and that's kind mm-hmm. of how that all started. Whereas in the United States, you guys you know gave them the middle similar, finger and said, well similar no. roots, but let's face it, things were a lot more I'm going to say decentralized in the in the beginning in, in yeah, a sense. Yeah, uh, I'm not going to say you know it was all free. And, and fantastic, but it was it was certainly different than than Canada's roots. Yeah, but apparently, uh, I listened to a podcast recently with um, oh, it was on Russ Roberts' podcast. There was a guy talking about the banking system in Canada and Ooh. how the banking system. Um, I think it was on Econ Talk in, in the last two months. It was really good, and it was about how just serendipitously or for, for whatever reasons, Canada's banking system has escaped um all the bizarre american uh, structural you know features and um you know the, can- the canadian banking system has turned out to be a lot better than what the u.s ended uh, up doing well maybe yeah. maybe before uh yeah. 30s there where we had like uh one of the freest banking systems in the world, actually. Yeah, we were actually a global banking hub in the early 1900s, right? But, but I mean, in in the mid 30s, we got the Central Bank of Canada that that came into existence. It's kind of funny because it's contrasted really well against the Ameri- you know, the, the American experience of the Great Depression and the Canadian experience of the Great Depression has this really interesting contrast. Where in the American experience, you you guys had thousands of local bank failures, mm-hmm. and in Canada, where we didn't have that lender of last resort. Right, like, like right. You could count them on one hand, right? right. Yeah, well, yeah, that's failures. that's what the guy pointed out. So um, that was that was quite interesting. So. Yeah, but I mean, um, but I mean, today, look, it, it, where we are just, now, it's funny. We used to have what was it in about two thousand nine, two thousand ten. We used to have this narrative where you know Canada's got this really strong banking system now, so we're right. you know we're really well positioned. And we never got a bailout either. Yeah, well, well, not a public one. We found that there was a lot of secret <laughs> bailouts going on. But anyway, we but 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 now, I mean, we don't even have that narrative anymore because it it would be laughable. Our consumer debt levels are ridiculously high. Yes. We have an overheated housing market. You look at it. It's worse than the states at the peak. You can buy a castle on the eastern side of Canada for as much (laughs) as it costs for a dilapidated one-bedroom bungalow on on the western coast of Canada. So it's just ridiculous how we're going on. It's not a good place now. (laughs) Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I think since the 60s, maybe up until the 60s or roughly something like that, um, it was superior. But nowadays, Mm -hmm. it's all being dominated by the the U.S.-type system and imperialism. Yeah. Um, Yep. Only six big banks, I think, hey? Is yeah, we've got six big banks, and uh, and yeah, they're all connected by this horrible octopus-like sort of central banking system. Hey, you know, the system that's shared around the world, right? Um, 
So, yeah, I guess, I don't know. In, in, I don't even know where we were going. So yeah, how did we get here? <laughs> yeah. So where did we? Uh, yeah, I don't started. know. I, I lost track. But uh, I think, uh, did you guys want to talk about the net neutrality? Sort I, of I did want to, yeah, I did yeah, want to bring that up with you, Stefan. So, so, so we do have, okay, we've talked about on the show here before net neutrality. I actually am very much opposed to any regulation that imposes, you know, this, this sort of fair internet use doctrine, right? Um, Stefan, right now there's something, can you kind of give me like a, a bit of a primer as to what's going on right now in the United States? Cause I know there's been some deregulation of some like, re-regulation, I guess you want to call it. Um, so, so yeah, yeah. So, so, so in the U S l- l- let's just talk about the main players. The main players will be the FCC, the federal communications commission, which governs radio transmissions and communications <laughs> But also the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, which governs antitrust and competition law. Okay, so here's my understanding: um, there was a, a case in 2010 which said that the FCC regulations trying to impose some version of net neutrality uh, were not legal because of the way the FCC is mandated. Um, now. I think the FCC can come back and they can just tailor those rules, which they're trying to do, to comply with the way their their mandate is, and they can impose some form of net neutrality, which means basically some kind of rule by the U.S. federal government against uh, ISPs that says you can't engage in certain forms of what they call discrimination, mm. right? Now apparently what's going on right now is they are proposing rules that say that you can't do outright discrimination. You can't – if you're an ISP, you can't block certain traffic that you don't like, like I guess child pornography or terrorism or a competitor signal. But you can grant faster access to someone who pays you a fee. So they're doing it the reverse way. So they're saying that if – some, like let's say Netflix makes a deal with a given ISP or cable company and says that – Netflix traffic is going to get a fast track on your ISP backbone mm. if they pay an extra fee, which of course will be passed on partially to the consumers, right? right. So it's 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 really discrimination uh, in reverse language. Now, as a libertarian, we have no problem with price discrimination, yeah. which means you can pay more for a better service. Right. Um, the real problem as, as a libertarian, as I see it, is that. Um, there are certain entrenched quasi-monopolistic interests that have a status that they wouldn't have without the government involvement in the first place. So there is not – there is a problem, but the solution is not to have the government come in and fix the problem because the government caused the problem in the first place. The solution is for the government to get out of it altogether and let, let a free market operate. Right. Um, so from what I've seen, the – the back down from the attempt by the FCC to impose net neutrality rules and the kind of uh, diluted version they're proposing now is is roughly a good thing. Although, as I said, I'm concerned that the FTC, the antitrust laws, will will be starting you, you, they they will start using those things after the fact. So it's almost like a free free speech regulation, whether it's before the fact or after the fact. I think what they're going to do is instead of saying ahead of time what you have to do, they're going to just watch the situation, and, and if the FTC says you have a monopolist, monopolistic position or you're abusing your monopoly, that's an anti-competitive thing to do. The FTC will step in. So I suspect that what's going to happen is the FCC <clears throat> um, regulations will be toned down, which is kind of a good thing. But in the background, the government will reserve the right to use antitrust law or competition law, as it's called in Europe, to come in after the fact and say you have you guys have to change what you're doing because you're abusing your monopoly status, right? Which the government which the government has given them, by the way, their but, monopoly. Well, status. yeah, of course. <laughs> so, so here, okay, here, here's a here's the problem I see with all of this, and and and, and you're right, Steph, to point out that really government is is the central focal point of of where the hiccups start, right? Because right. I there there are real serious problems here in that if you if you sort of re-regulate in a more free fashion, right, then you're 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 gonna have I wanna say, okay, you're gonna 
you're going to get a situation where, so you get, for example, Netflix, right? So they get to pay for uh, better uh, traffic from Comcast. So Comcast, from their perspective, because they're in a non-competitive environment, say, okay, so I've got, let's just split this into units of 100. I've got 100, you know, uh, whatever uh, units of bandwidth to give away. Netflix wants 10 of them. The other 90 I use for generalized internet traffic. Or let's say it's the other 80. And this use, this leaves 10 units of, of overhead, right? So you've got, you know, this 10 units of space. I, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to describe okay. bandwidth, right? Okay. But what happens in a non-competitive environment is instead of Comcast saying, well, that's getting a little tight. You know, we better we better actually build out more infrastructure. We better you know <laughs> better do. Instead of that happening, Comcast says, "Well, we don't really have to worry about competition. So what we'll do is we're just going to start charging more to keep that mm-hmm. small buffer zone mm-hmm. open, right? And, and everything's going to get more expensive. Nothing's going to get built out. Basically, what I'm trying to clumsily explain is that the lack of competition coupled with this deregulation will be harmful to further development of internet traffic." It's not going to help in that respect, but it's not going to be because of the loss of net neutrality. It's going to be because of the remaining imposition of government established monopolies or otherwise constricted competition in the market. Well, I think that's um, very well said. I agree completely with what you just said. Um, uh, Another way to look at it is that the effect of these government policies is to slow down – innovation and Mm -hmm. dynamic reform of market solutions that would otherwise occur. Um, We can see this in copyright law. I mean, you have these legacy industries like uh, Hollywood and the music industry, and they are clinging on for dear life to the outdated models that originated in the 40s, 50s, 60s, Mm -hmm. 90s in the U.S. Um, And they will milk it as long as they can, right? So not only in music and creative work, but in technology as well, like 3D printing and other things, pharmaceuticals, they will cling to their monopolies as long as they can. They will extract every dollar they can until the model becomes unviable. Yes, eventually these government-granted monopolies, whether it's copyright or patent or other forms of monopolies that are sort of hidden and obscured, like the ones we're talking about with net neutrality and the FDA process for pharmaceuticals, etc., they will finally recede Mm. and pass away because of time or because of technological innovation. But it does hamper and impede and slow down progress. Uh, It lets people cling to old models. Um, We we think we're modern in 2014. We feel like we're modern. But there is no telling what kinds of um, innovations that we're going to have in 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years – Steph, Some of which we may have had already I, I w- if, if the government hadn't slowed things down. I will agree with you that it does impede, but I think it also does – it also enforces people to innovate because then they, then they use the decentralization of the internet to get around yeah. copyright and open source. Open source wouldn't exist if we wouldn't have had government copyright. Well, I yeah, I, I, I agree. You, you could argue that Bitcoin, for example, would not, would not have emerged yeah. if the government hadn't cracked down on gold. So some Austrians and libertarians think that gold is the ideal money, let's say, right. um, and that in a, free, in a free society, a private law society, as Hoppe calls it, we would have gold. And maybe Bitcoin would never have emerged in the way it has. But Bitcoin has emerged because of a response to the way the government has controlled things. So there are some things that have emerged – because of government control, which which only is an indication that the government distorts law and life and society and culture. It distorts things. It corrupts things, right. which is similar to the business cycle of, of Mises, uh, you know, the idea that the, the entire business cycle of the economy is corrupted and distorted by yeah. government interventions mm-hmm. and has effects. I, I can agree with that. I'm not sure if I agree entirely that something like Bitcoin wouldn't have come out of the ether because, uh, yes, Bitcoin is primarily right now, it's kind of a, a, a way to route around the market dysfunction that is government distortion, right? But at the same mm-hmm. time, you know, there are real fundamental values that are expressed by Bitcoin. You know, it, it, it solves that old problem that computer programmers had, right? Sure. Yeah, exactly. So Bitcoin in, in the field of computer science solves the Byzantine generals problem. It, it, it provides a new sort of technology for 
uh, triple entry accounting, yep. a- accounting yep. and open ledger system. So there are other value expressions there, right? And I, you know, I, I, I think, yeah, okay, it's, I think it's apropos to say that, yeah, this stuff wouldn't have emerged in the same fashion. That kind of goes right. without saying. But would it have emerged? Yeah, probably, because this is simply a case of, of utility. Is it useful to the human condition or is it not? And, and if it is, right. yeah, I think there's a, a motivation to develop it, right? Yeah, no, no, I no, I totally agree with that. I, um, I'm probably overstating my case. I, uh, <laughs> I just think that the anti-state or a way of getting getting around state uh, interventions is one one reason people yeah. are going to Bitcoin right now, and that that would not exist absent the state. But the other the other advantages very well could be. Look, maybe Bitcoin would have emerged 30 years ago without the government. You know, I don't know. Yeah, sure. um, but but I mean the, the the state is essentially a a violent obstruction, right? So if you're if you if you if you get rid of that violent obstruction, it seems to me that it's yeah, you get rid of a, a market motivation for overcoming that violent obstruction, but in 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 the absence of that violent obstruction, oh God. it seems like there's just so much better motivation oh. to develop in the marketplace and also we much more freedom, right? We can dream, man. So 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 <laughs> <laughs> we can dream. That's why we talk about this stuff. But it just seems like in an open market, vi- absence that violence, absence the you know the outright murder of a quarter billion people over the last century, Ugh. that kind of thing. Absent that, there seems to be a lot more opportunity for innovation than than uh, than exists today because as a consequence of obstruction. That's what I'm trying to kind of lay out. Yeah, yeah. Well, I unfortunately I agree with you, so I don't think we have a disagreement here. <laughs> I, I, I'm totally I'm totally in tune with you guys on this. Um, That's okay. I, I like it yeah. when people say they agree with me. I, I'm, I'm quite <laughs> I'm, I'm okay with that. Time. Every time. <laughs> I grin every so time. did we flesh out? Did we flesh out really? Uh, like, because essentially, net neutrality. The cursory overview from the general population is net neutrality. That that is a good law yeah. that is in place, yeah, and it, it, it protects the individual on the internet from the big scary corporations, and of course, you know that is a like I remember when this debate was happening of the net neutrality bill. This was the very first law to regulate the internet, and this this law was being touted as <sighs> yeah. the law to end all laws to be further <laughs> for regulating the internet, and it's just like wait they're 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 putting their hand in the pot. <clears throat> And they're saying that this is the only one we're going to do. Like, I'm going to believe that one, hey, yeah. you know, type of thing. So, well, why? so, so, so here's, here, here's what I think is the best possible spin on it. Um, the average person is not that in tune with our libertarian sensibilities. Yeah. And they equate, equate big corporations with the government. Now they're not completely wrong to do so. They, right. they do sense they do sense some connection, and we decry that as libertarians as corporatism, mm-hmm. or crony capitalism, or whatever. So they're not completely wrong, and they sense that something is wrong, and they just want freedom. They don't want these companies to do unreasonable, outrageous things, and they sense, I believe, that these companies are get are able to get away with things they couldn't get away with if they weren't connected to the government or the state in the first place. So I think the general sensibility is basically right. Um, it's informed by sort of an incomplete political and technological understanding, but I can understand the average person's um, sensibilities. Um, here's what I would say. I would say the internet is a profound development in human history. You know, would it start 15, 17 years ago? 1995, 1994, yeah, roughly. Well, I mean, yeah, yeah. Right there. kind of consumer right. level, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in terms of its blossoming and being aware of uh, everyone being aware of it. And uh, any government regulation that threatens to control it is something we should be very concerned about. And I would, I would, I would include that any net neutrality regulations by the government, pro or con. I mean, if the government is getting involved at all in it, I think we should be concerned. So we should just push for a very free internet as free of government control and restriction as possible. And luckily, I think that it's gotten the genie out of the bottle. I think that with encryption, with uh, second and third internets, with Bitcoin, name coin type, type technology, mm. um, hopefully the internet has gotten to a point where it cannot be snuffed out. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I kind of think if, if the U.S. government and the other governments had realized in 1990 <laughs> or 95 what the Internet was going to result in, 
plus you know cell phone technology, video recording, mm-hmm. all this mm-hmm. stuff. They would have they would have just outlawed it, but it's too late. I think it's too late. And so let's let's hope that by the time they become aware of other things like encryption technology, Bitcoin, um, it's going to be too late to outlaw it. So um, I think no matter the details of any government regulation of the internet under the guise of net neutrality or censorship or stopping terrorism or pornography, child pornography, uh, money laundering, whatever, we have to be extremely skeptical of any government attempts to have any any authority whatsoever over you know these kind of communications between people over the um, distributed um, yeah. network we call the internet you know i i like to think kind of a ed stoner corner i, I like to think that the internet <laughs> the internet is the brain synapses you know how the brain mm-hmm. each individual mm-hmm. brain cell is like a, piece, a little piece of information is kept there mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We are those. We, each person is that uh, that brain cell, and then the internet is the synapses that connect us all together. So it, the hive mind, this hive mind idea, where <laughs> you have you know, that's why I said that's why I proved you're, you're you're losing all of your you're losing all of your Rush fans and your Iron Man fans right now. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know. There's, there's it'll set us free, man. I really do think that this is going to set get, us free. Getty Lee and Neil Peart are like rolling over in their <laughs> premature graves right now. <laughs> well, I mean, there's some, there's some, <laughs> there's some merit to the idea that you 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 have this kind. Of, it, it, it is, I think, Ed is describing kind of a, a mutual uh, collaboration structure, right? You get uh, there's an opportunity here for people to be able to collaborate in a manner that they never would have been able to before. You know, pre 1995. And, and that's that's been so significant. There's been so much value in that infrastructure. I mean, right. it, it's it's just huge. You know, it was so easily dismissed at the time. We had on our Bitcoin uh, weekday show, we had uh, uh, somebody, uh, was it Tur? I can't remember if it was Tur to Misa or not. It was somebody telling us about how, you know, this visionary uh, at the time was saying, well, you know, if the Internet's so great, why does my local mall do mm. more business in a day than the That's whole right. Internet does in a month, right? Right, and right, it, right. It's like there, there now, of course, is very clearly that huge value expression. It, it, communication is so valuable. And I think that's part of also why you're right, Stefan, in that it, it probably has come to a point where it can't be snuffed out anymore, especially now when you look at open source uh, decentralized technologies that are being developed uh, by people in, in various uh, ha- uh, hack space communities, that kind mm. of thing. So I, I don't know. I see this as, yes, it is a giant collaborative effort that involves anybody who wants to participate. And I've, I think, I think Sharing it's, that information is it's part of that path to freedom. It's part mm-hmm. of that path to making those centralized structures that we're so used to that people think of. You know, you mentioned people, you ask them on the street, what is a law? It's whatever, you know, the elected representatives wrote down on paper. Well, I think we're, fa- we're fast approaching that point in time where a law or an idea becomes so much less uh, centralized than that. And people start to understand that it's what comes out of the ether. Mm. Uh, yeah. I think I think so too, and I, but I do think that there's a growing sense of uh, of uh, illegitimacy among people. Mm-hmm. They, they 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 know the government is a joke. Basically, they put up with it. They think it's necessary, but they think it's incompetent and unjust and increasingly a joke, which I think is a good thing. Mm-hmm. Um, um, but, so, uh, and if you think of, if you think about the institutions and the practices in society that are being undermined by technology and free markets. I know left libertarians uh, decry globalism and shipping tangerines from New Zealand on a ship to the U.S. and whatever right. because they think it's subsidized by public roads and shipping lanes protected by the U.S. military, et cetera. But globalization and the Internet has done something. So, for example, you, you can hire – you can outsource some guy in, in, in Chile or, or India – the web services you need for your for your for your website or for your for your radio show, um, and so there's this commerce that's increased and this interconnection, this intercourse between people, right? Um, and the government can't stop that. They can't regulate you talking to a friend in Bolivia or mm-hmm. hiring him to design a logo for you if you need it for your business. Mm-hmm. Right, so to my mind, these things are slowly creeping out of the government's control, 
And if the government cracks down on it, then we can use encryption and we can use torrents and we can use a dark net. Uh, mm -hmm. Lots of techniques that the government just is going to increasingly be unable to, to stop. So I think that it's like water sort of finding the cracks. Mm. Liberty is like water, mm -hmm. right? It's going to mm. find these cracks and it's going to seep through and it's going to keep going and the government just can't <sighs> put their fingers in all the dikes. I hope. Wow. I hope. I like that note yeah. of finality, and it's mm -hmm. probably a good place to to yeah. kind of leave off for now. And there's more stuff I wanted to talk to you about, Stefan, but I know we're taking up a lot of your time, and I really do appreciate because you came to us today on, on pretty short notice, so um, <clears throat> it's very kind of you to stick around with us as you have. Um, look, there's there's so much out there in respect to how liberty finds uh, that next human mind, right? How mm. how it expresses value to people, and I think you're absolutely right to talk about it like water going through the cracks. It's just it's that inevitable. <laughs> That's the way I see you it. Sound like Marxists talking about. Uh the, uh, <laughs> the the inevitable Marxist revolution. Now, uh, well, history I, I just well, forward, well, but... I, I will I will just say that I I hope along with Marxists that the state will wither away, uh, just not in the way not in the way that they that they thought. <laughs> well, I don't know. To, to me, it seems like Marxists want the state to wither away Be before they take it over and state. destroy everything. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. All exactly. right. So, Stefan, thanks a bunch. I want to mention again, c4sif.org is where you can find Center for Study of Innovative Freedom, and, and there's so much good material you throw up on there. So I'm, I'm, uh, I really do hope people do check that out. And, and also, I, are you still doing that uh, that podcast with, oh, with Mr. Jeffrey Tucker, Tucker. there? Every, every yeah, year? well, we were doing a weekly thing called Liberty Talk, and we yeah. need to uh, – I think next week we may revive that. So, yes, and Jeff, and cool. I, Jeff and I talk often, and we're going to do another podcast. Yeah. Well, Jeff's, uh, Jeff's been pretty busy, hey. With so, so I mean, I don't yeah. know. I guess, I guess it's probably been difficult to line that up again and again. Um, but yeah, all right, cool. So, Stefan Kinsella, thank you very much for joining us today. I really do appreciate it. It's always a lot of fun to talk to you, and I'm sure we'll have you back again at some point. Thanks, guys. Good to do it. All right, cheers. Always love Stefan coming on, man. He's yeah, oh, yeah. He's a good guy. He's got a good brain on his head there, and. I, lo I love the fact that we, we, we like to plug that reluctant path journey because <laughs> it yeah. really is, man. It's, yeah. it's so tough. Well, you know, it, it would seem contradictory, right? But, I mean, here's yeah. the thing. is, is, is Stefan Kinsella is, he is in that world. He's got mm -hmm. the best understanding of it that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting to see somebody kind of that view from mm -hmm. the inside. Mm -hmm. It's very cool. And just quickly, before we move on to the BitTorrent thing with, with Netflix and, and talking about that, I, I brought this up in the show. It, we didn't really touch on it much, but people, I, even libertarians, it seems, have mm. really tough time with intellectual property. Oh, right. You yeah, know? yeah. Yeah, it's it true. Seems, it just seems like they, they feel, they don't feel right when when possibly people are, are, are there, that someone is imp imposing, or yeah. impo um, taking their work and passing it off as their own and then selling it. And they think that they're really entitled to those consumers, which yeah. is really tough. Like, it, it's tough for some people to get the, the rap. Like, I know for myself, it took me a little bit. And it honestly did. Oh, yeah. But once I understood the principle, I was like, yeah, that makes total no, sense. No, it's same for me, too, right? Was It was basic. And it's all about that consequentialist thinking, right? Is is But what about those people who depend upon the current paradigm? Mm -hmm. What about those people who are, who are producing art? What about those people who are doing so in within the system that exists today? How are they served? And that's very consequentialist, right? Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't speak to principle. And, it speaks to and, wants for certain and outcomes. And once you point out, though, that that you are the aggressor if you mm -hmm. want the state to protect your right to your consumers, once you point that out, man, right there you got to feel something that ain't that ain't right. Like you, you are the aggressor. You definitely are the aggressor if you're getting the state to go and attack people because they're they're copying your work. Yeah. Yeah. So that's something to think about. But. In the sense of uh, this whole net neutrality nonsense, a solution mm -hmm. to Netflix, uh, well, BitTorrent, yay, BitTorrent. Well, yeah, there's a, there's there's this idea out there that uh, Netflix should defeat uh, internet service providers by by utilizing peer to peer technology, right? Because because this is one of the things, when we talk about net neutrality and we talk about preferential treatment for certain service providers, like mm -hmm. say Netflix. Mm -hmm. um, 
then you get into this position where, well, you know, the ISPs are kind of the gatekeepers. Well, what's the answer to the gatekeeper? Decentralization, mm-hmm. de- yeah, you know, distribution of networks, and that's what peer to peer is. So, so how would this work? Like, like now the technology exists, and you can right now mm-hmm. download a file like a TV show on uTorrent and stream it while it's downloading. Yeah, like that is like it's so <laughs> incredible. So is. what is stopping Netflix from kind of setting up a little similar system where two people are watching the same show? Why yeah. couldn't they just share that traffic? Like there's yeah. all it would be was be a quick little code thing. Like I don't know how it works. Maybe it wouldn't be a quick code, but it seemed like it would be fairly simple to have that set up. So then that that help. So then net um, service providers would be like, "Yay, good." <laughs> Maybe maybe not the service providers that are throttling uh, torrent traffic. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it might not be so good for those consumers. Well, service providers but, that want to facilitate the that sort of a network traffic, they want want to be able to be able want to be able to help people access uh, distributed uh, internet traffic. Then sure, it'd be good for them. I, I just find it hilarious that that the 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 service providers, you know, they they're, they're upset that that uh, you know. That people are downloading big files or streaming uh, stuff because it, it it hogs up a lot of the, lot of the network. And then the free market, the 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 nobody specifically, nobody invented uh, this idea of of torrenting, right? Right? It, it, oh, maybe there was one there, person. There's there's a I progenitor for the idea. Um, yeah, but it was but, it was a guy that uh, oh I can't remember his name. But, was uh, he from Sweden? I'm I'm guessing <laughs> from Sweden. I don't, I don't know. know. Actually, I think I he's know. an American. But but yeah, it's it's interesting because. This would solve their problem. It's just, it would solve the problem because the traffic would be distributed throughout the whole network instead of just these big, massive uh, hogs of bandwidth that you need it's to take. funny, you know. The answer to all of this stuff in the technology space seems to be again and again and again. It could, like, I don't know if it, it just maybe Bitcoin <laughs> has provided me some context, but it's, it seems to be decentralization or distribution mm-hmm. every time. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. It's about it's about taking away the role of the gatekeeper and finding a solution in the market around what it that is a basically a market dysfunction, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So yeah, Netflix would probably do well to try to ser- and and I think they are actually. I think uh, in this yes, article, they, you they, up. yeah, uh, they are looking into uh, researching peer to peer architecture. Yeah, so that's cool. Yeah, that is pretty cool. Um, there were some other stories I wanted to I wanted to look at real quick. There's okay. We do you remember on uh, I can't remember how many episodes it was ago, but I was I was I was kind of uh, moaning and whining about hey, you know why shouldn't I be able to put some decals on the side of my truck and scream down the highway <laughs> with flashing lights and a siren? And everybody get out of my way because I'm a trucker. You know I'm a hero. Yeah. And it's funny because we when we were talking about that it was. It was kind of like you know, it was all tongue in cheek, you know. I'm, you know, I'm doing something for the community. I'm providing value, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. you know, police officers get this hero worship, but I do a job that I, you know, I put my neck on the line for it. Truck drivers die in the line of duty, right? <laughs> so, so where's my blind, stupid, nonsensical, know nothing, non minded, <laughs> you know, hero worship? Where's my, where's my, where's my hero worship? Um, and this is another statistic that kind of actually really bolsters that tongue in cheek argument. Turns out, top ten uh, most dangerous, most lethal occupations in the United States, cops don't even make the list. Yeah, and my job is actually it number is. seven. It is, it is I on was the list. Astonished, yeah. It's like, come on, I, it's just hilarious. You know, you, you think about this stuff. It, it's all humor. It's funny. It's but it turns out, you know, in humor, it's there's kind of a root of truth. And here, yeah. It's and it's not even it's it's number like, seven uh, truck drivers. Yeah, number yeah. seven truck drivers, twenty two point eight uh, to, uh, fatalities per hundred thousand employed. Uh, logging workers top the list at one hundred and twenty seven point eight fatalities per hundred thousand employed. Um, roofers, garbage collectors are on there. Uh, aircraft pilots, uh, electrical power Garbage line collectors. installation. Yeah, that one kind of perplexes me on that one. I don't know. Yeah, well, I don't know. They, they, they do hang off the side of those trucks for you often. Maybe they're, uh, you know, maybe they let go at the yeah, wrong time. I don't know. I haven't seen too many of that. I, Fall for the most a part, vicious dog. For the most part, they're like <laughs> truck know. drivers, and they just they just drive trucks. You'd think that that would 
Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, well, it depends on the technology used, right? Yeah, like, that's they, right, dif- There's different technology for, right. for picking up garbage, which and is it, kind of funny. And, it, and it's and it's they're, they're usually union <laughs> type jobs yeah. too. It, <laughs> it's from the city, so there's no innovation <laughs> in that respect, yeah. you know. So it yeah. doesn't surprise me that farmers and ranchers make the list at number nine. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, it, my experience when I was hauling grain. Uh, my experience on some farms is just hilarious. Like I remember, there was uh, there was one situation where the farmer was augering out. I think it was canola into into uh, into the truck. And so, he, when you get into a canola, like a, one of those grain storage bins, when you get to the bottom of the bin and all the canola is almost gone, basically what you have to do is you have to go into the bin and with a shovel, yep. shovel the canola Been into there, the auger. Done that. Yeah, fun stuff. Hot work, right? <laughs> that's oh, that's God, sweaty, it sucks. sweaty work. But anyway, and the, and the it's funny because usually yeah. these augers have a grill over top of them. So, you, you know, if That's you right. brush your foot against it, you'll hit the grill rather than get, get caught in. in the auger, right? <laughs> well, this old farmer, I remember <laughs> shoveling, you know, he's shoveling canola into the auger, no grill. And he's in this kind of pile of canola, so he's slipping towards the auger sometimes. He's like, oh, that was close. <laughs> like, you could die. It's interesting. It's interesting you, you talk about this. I, I actually, uh, I worked for a farmer. Uh, in my teen years where he actually had this little contraption set up where it was like this three-piece auger yeah. arm yeah. where he, you you connect to the auger and you, you you would have to just you just walk around in the bin and it would auger all the grain to it <laughs> okay. but it was completely exposed <laughs> Right? right, so you're like you're essentially like walking around with this thing that could like suck you into the machine, <laughs> and, and you're walking in grain, and the grain is like moving yeah. and stuff. It's like, man, it's super dangerous. Well, but you know, well, I, I remember all, when when good, I was but. in that situation, I was there with another driver who was basically teaching me that you know, showing me the ropes, and I, I remember looking at him going. That's not really very safe, and he's like, "Well, welcome to the farm, you know." <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> but but you, I mean, you get paid a little bit more too. Like I remember, I got, yeah. I got a decent wage to do a little bit more dangerous work because you know it was, yeah. it was more dangerous, and I was getting paid. Uh, I think it was getting paid more than minimum wage too because yeah. of that. And when I was in the oil reward. field, uh, it was more dangerous than the oil field. That's actually where I broke my neck initially. Yeah, when, initially, I mean, you know, all the other <laughs> all the other times too it was terrible. No, I've only done that <laughs> once, thankfully. But we, you know, uh, I got I got a very good premium pay, not just because oil is valuable, but because also I was doing work that you know was a little bit more demanding, more tough, and more dangerous. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, you, you that's a value judgment you trade off, but. But the t- cops, I'm sorry, you know what? Pretty safe job in respect to lethality. Because, you know, you buy into that myth, right? A yeah. police officer goes out to protect the community and protect you from the evil villains that patrol our streets or whatever, right? Like, you, you Firefighters buy aren't myth. on the list either. I, I kind no, of firefighters me. aren't. And that's kind of interesting. But you know what? Firefighters don't aggress against people. That's probably, yeah. you know, uh, that probably helps their safety. They have a more Even legitimate they- function. <laughs> No, but I mean, it's these emergency services. Um, I, you know, I find a great deal of respect for firefighters, for paramedics, but police officers, it's different. Police officers, we also, we, part of the reason that we are told this myth of how they protect the peace of our community, never mind the fact that they actually destroy it. But, you know, we, we get told this myth, and it's about how they put their, their necks on the line for us. Like, it's the ultimate sacrifice. That's where that hero worship comes from, right? Meanwhile, while I whip down the highway, risking my life, in fact, mm-hmm. in a much more real sense mm-hmm. than any police officer out there, you know, I can end up in a slough off a bridge, uh, hit a patch of ice, and I go flying off the road into a you know gaggle of cows. I don't know what could happen mm-hmm. to me, right? And, and I'm providing real nonviolent value. I'm not pulling somebody over for going too fast. I'm not beating the crap out of somebody for you know yeah. ingesting the wrong drug. I'm not out there... Uh, fining somebody for jaywalking, mm-hmm. you know, judging for their own whether or, or not it was safe to cross the street. I'm not looking at somebody going through a red light where there was no traffic and then causing them economic damage. Yes. Now, I agree with you. I agree with you 100%. But we also have to, they they do perform somewhat of a legitimate function of if you are getting robbed. You I know, think for the most, a vast minority. I know, I I'm, know. But it does happen. It does happen. And, uh, you know... It, they for the most part they come there and they they write on a piece of paper and they're like yeah yeah we'll we'll look after this like your stolen property or whatever but sometimes they do actually are legitimately helping people in a certain sense but it is yeah, it sure. is a small I, yeah you know you're right and that you're is right. their function to protect well, life and property 
in the no, idea a, of what they yeah, what that's they believe. Their asserted right? function, yeah. right? And, yeah. and we we've talked about that too about how insurance companies don't exist in a proper paradigm yes, to, to provide right. that real incentive. We talked about that guy who had the backhoe stolen, and he went to the police, and they that's said, right. well, basically, okay, it's sorry, it's it we'll really sucks that your big you know half or quarter million half million dollar piece mm-hmm. of equipment is gone, but oh well. So what did he do? Hired a helicopter. I think it was a helicopter to yeah, fly yeah, around yeah. and look for it and found it. Mm-hmm. But the police didn't help him because they didn't have any incentive to help him, right? Yep. This is a non-competitive yep. service that's provided to people uh, on the basis of violent theft and, that is taxation. And I do, and I kind of have to backtrack. So I, they, they do have a, 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 the, the, the idea they have to protect us. But we've seen in a couple court cases in the United States to show that they actually don't. Have an incentive because remember there was More like than a couple, yeah. <laughs> so and like we actually have a story in the, in the list there too where they go outright steal from people and well, they get them get go prosecuted. To that story that was um what was that that was uh no, oh there it is one yeah it's uh, from Philly dot com so okay there are twenty two Philadelphia bodega owners right and these people are you know they're just running their businesses. And not really related to one another. There might be some connection in a couple of cases, but basically 22 separate individuals who all have the identical story. <laughs> okay? <laughs> it's... Huh. Hmm, yeah, okay. Hmm, I wonder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so basically, um, a Philadelphia plainclothes narcotics squad uh, barreled into the immigrants' bodegas, guns drawn. They cut the wires on the, video store, on the store's video surveillance systems. Mm-hmm. Wow, man! They actually, like they really robbed thousands of dollars from the cash drawers, stole food and merchandise, and then trashed the shops on their way out the door. This sounds like something from like uh, some third world country. Somewhere. Oh well, as it says here in the article, you'd think that would have been enough to get the cops busted or at the very least fired. But this is Philadelphia, <laughs> where a disgusted veteran officer tells the writer here, "The only way a cop can lose his job in this city is if he shoots another cop during roll call." <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, basically, um, they uh, they these these police officers who outright stole, and they were in they were in their uniforms too. Uh, that was plain clothes. Was there one? are instances of uniformed officers doing this, um, but basically they're not going to lose their job. They're they're on desk duty for now, and they're going to be back out on the street eventually. Wow, protecting and serving you some more. Hmm. Good stuff. Yeah, it's really messed up. Like it, it, it's crazy. This is it's about the incentive system and how it's structured, right? Mm. Does the incentive system yeah. actually provide? competitive means for finding why somebody wants a service. Would you voluntarily give your money to a, a service that robs people outright? Or Plain robs you. Robs you. <laughs> yeah. Like, like what? Like, ah, like, like there's the whole robbing thing through taxes and then there's the whole actual, well, I don't know what say because the robbing thing, taxes, that's actual robbing too. But there's like right out blatant theft and robbery from the police. You, yeah, and and it, it it it's it's so disrespectful. It's so like it it is it is not that customer service focused interaction, right? Mm-hmm. There's this other story mm-hmm. too of this uh, an Air Force captain, and it's funny, you know, in this in this article that we pulled up, he's uh, it's Nicholas mm, Aquino, I think. So he's yep. there's a video at the bottom of this article, and it's basically him touting. You know, join the Air Force. I'm an Air Force <laughs> captain. This is about freedom. Is and I want to serve here. my country. Yeah. And it's so glorious and great. This is what freedom like, tastes like. like my you parents know? ran from tyranny yeah. to come to the United States. He was given two two hours to leave the country or he was going to get Something locked like up. Something like that, yeah. yeah. Uh, but so then what does this, you know... Uh, this Air Force captain who engaged in this propagandist video about how great the Air Force is and how wonderful it's serving your country is. Well, it turns out that he's probably not going to be, well, it, at the, for the time being, he's not be able to go back to school. He's got a military-based education that's going on, but he, he's not going to be able to attend school because he's being charged with something. Now, he's being charged with, I think it was resisting arrest and obstructing, what was it? Um, mm, sh- no, 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 no. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, that's um, what it was. It, it, which is which is incredible because that doesn't make any sense. How can you be charged with that? There should there has to be okay. something initially 
well, wrong well, here's in the what first happened, place. Okay. So, so yeah, seven weeks after the ordeal, he received a warrant for his arrest from county prosecutors for resisting arrest and obstructing a, pl- a peace officer. So, so here's what happened. He was walking around his home. Uh, I don't know if it was on his outside. own property. Yeah, I yeah. believe it was outside. I think it was outside his home, although I don't think it's specific in the story. But anyway, um, somebody calls. And says, you know, there's a suspicious person, suspicious person walking around mm. the outside of this house. Cops show up, uh, demand identification from him. He's on his own property, so he says no. <laughs> um, he <laughs> First asks, mistake right there. Yeah, he asks if he's being detained. So then the cop says, oh. yes, you are being detained. Um, so then he shows him his ID, um, and he even he even gets to a point where he has he shows them bills that proves he's the resident wow. of that location. He gets handcuffed, thrown in the back of a cruiser. The cops break into his home. Okay, mm. I'm not sure if it was unlocked and they just walked in, whatever. But they basically they go into his home. Um, now he's being he's facing basically he here's the the genesis. He didn't of have any illegal. They didn't right? find any illegal drugs in his house. No, so the fishing expedition. I assume they probably yeah. went on when they went inside, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. But he, but basically, here's what it boils down to: he was walking around on his own property. Cops show up, harass him. Now he's being charged with resisting, or like they this initiated this incredible. problem. Yeah, it's a, and it, some busybody too, right? Causing. Yeah, somebody peering over there. He's a suspicious individual. Uh-huh. <laughs> like, like, I, you know, and even if even if that was, uh, you know, maybe that's not all bad. Maybe when somebody's walking around your house and they're, you know, wearing a dark shirt and carrying around like a big red he's got, he's picking wearing a, bag he's wearing or something. A yeah, sure. or a ski mask <laughs> or whatever. Like, yeah. Maybe you'd want somebody to call the local protection service to say, hey, you, you, should, you guys should check this out. I mean, like, you know. Um, you know, he's, he's suspiciously poking a coat hanger into a car. I don't know. Like, you know, you, maybe you'd want somebody to call. That's not unreasonable. But when the cops show up and basically they're power tripping, right? Mm-hmm. They're just yeah. showing like, you know, yeah. th- it's a simple inquiry, right? Do you live here? Yes or no? Yes. Anything you might be able to show me to prove that you do? Because, you know, your neighbors are kind of worried that mm-hmm. your home might be being treated. That sounds uh, you know, reasonable. Yeah. You know. I mean, and even at that point, it's basically, you know, you have to kind of take the... You you don't have any information that tells you specifically that this suspicious person is engaged in any nefarious activity. Mm -hmm. Well, you could just say, no, it's my house. And you don't... Should you really need to provide that it's your house? Do you need to Mm -hmm. prove that? If you're on your own property... I don't know. I mean, well, no, you shouldn't have to provide more than that. No. And really, if it's if it's come down to the point where you're contracted with a, with a protection service, maybe ahead of time you should tell the protection service, "Hey, here's a photo of me. Uh, here's here's what my name is. I I I have this color of skin. I talk with an accent. I don't know, like anything mm-hmm. that the protection service mm-hmm. might want to know. Maybe when the protection service contracts you, uh, contracts with you, they say we request a photo so that when the officers arrive at a location, your property, they can pull up a photo on the computer to say, oh, this is what this guy looks like. Like you know, there's so many possibilities. But basically, what you have to keep in mind at all times is when you're approached as a private individual. What are your requirements? What 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 are your rights? And your rights are not to be aggressed against mm-hmm. in any case. Mm-hmm. That's it. Unless you are initiating force. Yep. There's the exception. That's it. Now, I, I like to kind of segue to this uh, anonymous the Supreme Court authorizes warrantless stops and searches based on anonymous tips. <sighs> so this kind of it, we just yeah. came from a story where an anonymous tip essentially caused the guy's rights to be violated. Now the U.S. Supreme Court is saying that, yeah, uh, yay, go tyranny, go. Yeah, in a very firm five to four split decision, <laughs> by the way, because the law is so clear. What, what's interesting <laughs> here is, like, if you talk to anybody that lives in uh, East Germany, you know, mm-hmm. like 20 years ago, right? It was more than maybe 20, 20 25, 30 years ago. Yeah, something. Okay. I'm getting old. <laughs> <laughs> I still think we're in the You're 90s. You're not talking about this in high school anymore, man. <laughs> yeah. So they, they would say that the, the system, the people were put into compliance because based upon neighbors snitching. And it was a huge network of people that would just snitch. And, and that's kind of how the system worked where you were aggressed against. And you, you basically, before you spoke to your neighbor, you would make sure that no one else be looking around. And you'd be maybe even thinking that, is my neighbor going to snitch on me now? Mm. Am I going to be put to, sent away uh, because of what I'm saying? Uh, this is kind of the similar 
thing that's happening now, and it's being justified by the state to say that they can actually Ooh. continue to do this. Hell of a perspective. Creepy. Yeah, it is creepy. creepy. And it comes down, again, to violation of those natural rights you yeah. have not to be aggressed against, not to have force initiated against you. So... This is crazy, right? The idea that this freedom-loving land that the United States could could now, through its court system, basically say, yeah, anonymous tips, that's okay. And what's really bad about that <sighs> is you get what an abusive is, bureaucracy, if, right? Maybe, mm. maybe you've got, and, and, and you know, oh, this is so crazy, isn't it? Even if you get a, a, a system where, okay, look, if you're a cop, you have to at least say that you got a phone call and it's got to be provable, like there's got to be a phone record or something, mm -hmm. fine. Then you're a power-tripping cop, you buy a burner cell phone, I was just gonna call say. yourself, done. You can you can right? essentially violate anybody's rights outright, no right. matter what and now. It, and it's, no not, matter it's what. not an argument about... It's incredible. It's not an argument about whether or not you think bureaucrats and government agents are good people. It's just, look, is there an opportunity for rife abuse mm -hmm. being monopolized mm -hmm. and not market, market accountable... If the answer is yes, then it's going to crop up. And in this case, anonymous tipsters being able to uh, be the justification for why you're being stopped mm -hmm. on the road, that means, look, in a realistic sense, that means anybody in the United States can be stopped on the road at any time yeah. and have a fishing expedition go on just because well, some anonymous cop with a burner phone, I mean, <clears throat> anonymous uh, tipster, phoned the cops and said, I think that person has drugs in their car. You yeah, should search it. Not even their car. You could talk about the uh, New York City stop and frisk, <sighs> right? Like incredibly racist, incredibly uh, anti-freedom. In its application, yeah, it's incredibly racist, but on its fundamental quarter, base, They it's have quarter just, systems. Yeah. To, yeah, you got to go out and violate people's rights. Yeah, well, and if you that, don't, that... you're going to be internally... Um, <laughs> reprimanded for it like was it oh that, my that, God. that cop that was speaking anonymously said that is his uh was it is his uh his captain or something said or maybe it was a sergeant that said something about uh, we're gonna go out and violate people's rights today mm. and the big speech in the room yeah, yeah. yeah before they go, was get, stock and get all stock riled and up yeah it's like it, it, it's just it's amazing because that's how this stuff devolves right and <sighs> it's about that monopolization of power yeah you know, because Stefan mentioned, right, that you, you, maybe all of this stuff is a market incentive. And I, you know, yeah, it's it's just obstruction. It slows down progress mm -hmm. and freedom. Mm -hmm. It snuffs it out in some cases. You know, there is no when you're when you're when you're looking at an end result, the path to that result is so very rarely, if ever at all, a straight line. It, there's lots of different sort of uh, situations that happen individually along that path. That are different, you know. Some when I look at the, the how the market works in general, right? Uh, sometimes there's a market failure. You know, a business closes up shop and goes bankrupt. Um, that doesn't mean that a market is unproductive. It means there was an instance of failure. There are also instances of success where uh, where yeah. businesses grow and become prosperous and successful. So either thing can happen. And in the case of uh, in the case of when a state impedes growth. I think that growth still happens. I think the market still wins, whether or not you want it to, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it slows it down. And it, 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 but it's, is it that market incentive? Is it provide? No, it's, it, it, it is just flatly an impediment, right? Mm -hmm. Doesn't stop it, but it does slow it down. Um, yeah, did, I don't know where I got. Did, did, did you want to do one more? Because we're coming up to, a, we're a, either coming up to it or past the two-hour mark. Uh, I don't know if you wanted to get to one more that you really wanted to get to uh, here. Or... You know, I really would like to do that polygamy one because, okay, yeah, you know, sure. this is this is a... Um, this, this topic always really interests me because it's about culture and, and personal mm. proclivities and how mm -hmm. we uh, how mm -hmm. we how we uh, project those personal proclivities uh, onto uh, others and, and, and groups of other people, right? So... An article from Slate is arguing for the legalization of polygamy. And I guess from Slate, Yay. this shouldn't be... Well, you know, from Slate, it shouldn't be well, surprising because yeah, yeah. Slate's very left-wing, right? That makes sense, um, yeah. So left-wing news sources are usually very into the sexual liberation stuff, right? Um, I, I'm kind of excited that this is being talked about in more of a mainstream, uh, in a yeah. sense, and, and not so uh, um, religious-y, cultural, non, you know... 
Like even like yeah. uh, the show Big Love kind of uh, brought out brought forth that the discussion on polygamy and sure. whatnot too. Yeah, it and did. That, that that reality TV show. I think I never actually watched it, but there was a there was a reality TV show really? that was based upon yeah a polygamous family in Utah. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay, interesting. Um, but there's okay. So here, here's what I what I think of when I see stories like this, and and it's a very interesting. You know, actually, there's some really good writing in here. They did talk about uh, a lot of different uh, sort of you know the arguments and counter arguments to uh, legalization of polygamy. But what this says to me is about uh, it, it talks about cultural. Um, I want to say hangups in a way because okay. Here, I, I'm not even really an advocate of polygamy per se. I'm just an advocate of letting people live as they choose to live, right? So I don't care if it's a, a family with a patriarch at the head, you know, one man and several women and then the children, or if it's one woman and several men and the children. That'd be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I don't know. Like, it's, it's possible, yeah. Sure. Or if it's, you know, like uh, four men and four women or two men and... Twelve women. There we go. That's <laughs> that's the that's the configuration. No, I'm, but like what I'm saying is, I don't really care what the configuration is. I'm not really. I'm. I don't care about uh, polygamy or Consenting polyamory adults. or whatever. Right? Yeah. What's what I, polyamory? What's that? Polyamory is is those multiple configurations okay, I was talking okay, about. Right? Where okay. you you got you've got people who can love more than so one. Polygamy is specifically male, one male, multiple wives. Or one wife and multiple husbands. Okay. Right? It, it's it's basically um, a patriarch or matriarch. Okay. So okay. there is a head of the family, right? And and I guess polyamory would be more of an informalized, generalized relationship. That'd be like um, the hippie communes. Dude. <laughs> Where they just all shared the, This is my wives. first wife, Starflower, and my <laughs> second husband. Um, I don't know what's a what's a hippie guy name. I don't. I should, um, no, I kind of grew up. I got in hippie. nothing. Uh, yeah, yeah, man, what the heck? Uh, Autumn Ethan. harvest. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, okay. So, but but the point is, you have these potentials for for very different relationship configurations, and I think that the reason that people don't like uh, certain configurations, for example, uh, polyamory, is basically because. If you get okay, you you if you get yourself into a relationship and you look at your partner and you say, "I don't want my partner to uh, go and have sex with somebody else," right? Um, mm-hmm. And that's not unreasonable in some cases. Like if that's your preference and if that's your partner's preference, then that's great. That's basically that's kind of your guys's contract between each other, right? Yeah. You set these boundaries, mm-hmm. and it's up to each one of you to either maintain those boundaries or adjust those boundaries in the future uh, consensually, right? If you go outside of those boundaries in a deceptive fashion, then you basically are kind of a jerk. Mm -hmm. (laughs) The YAD principle. Yeah, Yeah. you're a dick principle, right. So... It's it's interesting to look at, and I'm not saying that I'm not saying that everybody should you know have this polyamorous lifestyle or whatever. I don't really care. What I care about is your ability to determine that for yourself. So, where I was going with this cultural proclivity is that I look at I look at uh, a, a case where somebody might want to be in a relationship where their partner is allowed to uh, uh, engage sexually with others, and why? Okay. If you if you haven't established that voluntary contract of being exclusive to one another, mm-hmm. then what is the problem? Like I don't understand the logical root of why that would be a problem. Okay, uh, let me let me be the the cultural uh, person here. So <laughs> sex is intimate. You're in, being intimate, and you're sharing this connection of love. Right. So that is that's where you draw the line. With regards to uh, how you can have relationships. Okay. With yeah. 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 So basically, it's this idea that um, you know having a coffee is one thing. With so- having a coffee with somebody is one thing. Having sex with them is something else. <laughs> and and you know to a point that's yeah. true, right? There are yeah. certainly different chemical reactions in the body that take place in respect to sex. It's very unique. It's not having a cup of coffee, but in a in an ethical sense, there actually doesn't seem to be a difference. Like you're drawing this arbitrary line at you can have fun with somebody else, but not too much, right? I guess I'm just kind of just thinking off the top of my head. Maybe it could be because there's an, another life might be the result of that sexual sure, there, encounter. There are, yeah, there are different consequences, right? And if yeah. you if you drink alcohol with somebody as opposed to coffee, then your your health is going to be affected mm-hmm. differently. Mm-hmm. So, like, here's the thing, right? It's 
again, I want to I want to make sure that people don't get the wrong impression. Like I'm not saying that um, uh, relationships that are founded on you know uh, uh, exclusive uh, sexual pairings. Mm-hmm. Like I'm not saying that that's bad. Mm-hmm. I'm not. I'm what I'm saying is that you have to. You have to have the freedom to determine that for yourself. Mm-hmm. Like it, 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 that's just part of living the human condition. Like there. Now, now, when it comes to this polygamy thing, some people would object to the fact that you know lots of the polygamist families are they're closed off and from away from society, and you have oh. like sexual uh, molestation of children, like a, like an eighty year old marrying a fourteen year old type yeah. of thing. Like yeah, that's, that's that's really creepy. We're not saying that that we're that, that that's cool. Right, no, that, but a that's a cultural th- thing that is is unique to these societies that are closed off and they don't allow these women to be yeah. independent. It's it's part of it's partly that, and 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 I come back to the challenge issued by friends of mine: is you can't blame every, everything on the government. It's just give me a chance, <laughs> right? And, yeah. and in this case, look, a lot of those communities are closed off because um, culture has dictated that monopolized police forces basically abuse these people, right? Yeah. So if you are, let's say, um, actually in the Slate article, come to think of it, they point this out, right? So let's say you've, you're you a child in a polygamous family and you see a neighbor being abused. Maybe you don't want to call the police specifically because you know if the police come to your home and they do, by happenstance, figure out, hey, wait a second, this looks like a polygamous family. So not now, not only are they dealing with whatever you reported, maybe quite justly, but also now you've embroiled yourself in the legal system that does not approve of your family structure. And so now you might have just caused a huge bundle of problems for your mm. family. Better just not to get involved. And not only not only when you see a victim somewhere else, but maybe even when you're victimized yourself. Yeah, okay. So you are you're you're being you're being beaten, you're being raped, whatever, right? Like there's some some really serious stuff going on, and you are a massive you're massively a victim. But you know, if you call the police, if you call the agents of protection, you know, so-called, then your whole family might become victimized by the state. Isolating people like that causes some massive cultural uh, uh, distortion. Yeah, I think that it's a lot easier for those communities to basically embrace uh, what I'm going to call cultural nonsense and idiocy mm-hmm. in 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 doing things like marrying 80 year olds uh, uh, and 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 14 year olds together. Mm-hmm. Right? You 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 make you make this this den of of uh, of really unethical behavior possible because I don't think a 14-year-old is going to voluntarily enter into that sort of a relationship, right? I think that... that yeah, I don't think their brain is quite developed enough to, to even make only, that decision. Not only or that, how does that work? no, not, not, what, not even that. Like, I think there's just, it's easier to coerce and pressure is. somebody into yeah. that when well, that community is closed off. Yeah, exactly. When there are so many... Uh, options that are being uh, not uh, you know, not presented, yeah, not presented exactly, and, and and everyone around you is saying that it's all normal and completely fine, and the authorities in your life are saying that you have to do this. This is what you do, and everything. Right. So I don't know. It's tough, and I guess on that subject of of I guess we're kind of going away from from polygamy, but mm. the the when do you like when do you get to choose? Like being a kid, when do you get to choose like your own path? Like, because like the idea that twenty one or eighteen, yeah, that's I think that's total nonsense. Well, yeah, like, it's well, arbitrary. Like, all of a sudden, mm-hmm. one an age, and then oh, you get these special right. You you are a full adult. I, I think that's total nonsense. But like, there are, is there some science to support that you brain? Like, how do you say like? You are a full adult uh, because your yeah. brain is now developed enough, and you can make all these decisions on your own type of thing. Like, mm-hmm. obviously. Uh, like when, when it comes to uh, circumcision of, of males in, in, in Muslim cultures, they make that decision when they're 13 or 14, and that's when they become a male. That's when they become an adult and, and whatnot. I, I honestly don't think that, like, could an, a 13-year-old boy uh, okay. make that decision for themselves? I don't know if that if that's a if that's a if that's the right age to make that decision. And, of course, right. you have that same cultural thing where people just, that's what you do, and authorities telling you that's what you do, and if you don't, you're not a man or whatever and how it works. <laughs> right. Okay. So I don't I don't know I don't know. You're, you're asking about where that arbitrary line. Yeah. You know, is there a place to draw? And I think the answer is no. Uh, here, consider this, and I, I, 
need to preface this carefully. Um, I've become interested recently in social Darwinism. Ah. Okay. And social Darwinism, the reason I have to preface this carefully is because when people hear that... Um, Neg- well, very negative. Well, yeah. Yeah. Because social Darwinism has been used to justify things like uh, 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 eugenics. Yes. Right? That kind of stuff. Because <laughs> social Darwinism oh, in, the hands, in the hands of a statist is basically a way to... Well, how do you control the outcome of a population? How do you evolve it favorably? How do you use force to um, uh, evolve a society. So social Darwinism as a concept, though, seems actually rather rational to me, right? Okay. Uh, So here's how this works for me in respect to where where you draw the arbitrary line. Okay. I should say it seems rational because it seems just as rational to me as evolution. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it, uh, survival of the fittest, and that doesn't mm-hmm. mean, by the way, survival is the strongest. It means survival of those that fit best. The ones that can adapt most quickly to their environment. I exactly. think that's the definition. Yeah. So so in, in respect to social Darwinism, let's say, okay, let's, let's say you have two societies. One society has no respect f- at all for children. Children are essentially treated as garbage. Uh, hmm. you go, run with run with. I know. Me I'm, this, just okay? kinda, I'm just trying. I'm just thinking so, like so, now is. The word. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, but don't. That, that, All right. That spanking so, anyway. thing you posted there the other day. Yeah. So one one society treats their children badly. Uh, children, as a result, uh, uh, are dysfunctional, violent, uh, unable to make uh, good judgment calls. Uh, children basically are dysfunctional creatures in that society. Mm-hmm. You have another society that treats children with deep respect, uh, that treats children very well, that offers them support, love, and encouragement. These children are able to make good judgment calls. These children are able to grow up to be successful people. You know, so, Equ- in, treats them equally is, is I guess, possibly. A better term. Where, I'm just, I'm just well, trying to look good, for good. Like that could be totally subjective. That could good. be totally subjective. What I'm looking for is a comparison between the two societies to, uh, to demonstrate uh, what I think is a rational social Darwinist sort of approach. Okay. okay. So obviously, the society that treats their children badly is going to have massive disadvantages as compared to the society that treats their children positively. Yep, right. Yep. So the reason that I'm that I'm saying all of this is because I need to say something else that I think might be quite shocking. And that is that I think you have the right of self-ownership immediately when you are born. Mm. You have no concept of it, you have no way to understand it, but I do believe that you possess the uh the right of self-ownership even as an infant who cannot fend for themselves, okay? Okay. I also believe that nobody has a positive obligation to care for an infant, not even the mother. Mm-hmm. I don't think mm-hmm. there's an ethical foundation for that. I think there's a cultural foundation for that, and that's why I talk about social Darwinism. Mer- the maternity uh, instinct and, and whatnot. Not even too. that. Not no, even no, 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 but I like, think that I think that uh, develops, yeah. but I'm not even talking about that. Well, if you want to talk about evolution and, and, and social Darwinism, they... Yeah, yes, Evo, like evolu- the evolution of a human being to care for your child, to go to your child when they're screaming, like that is that's something that's like built into our DNA to do that in a sense. Yes. I'm not saying that you are obligated socially. The, ah, that's right. Yeah, right. I'm not saying that in that sense, but I'm saying that like there's a there's a there's something inside you that is, you know, you need to like, I don't know, being a dad and 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 and, and caring for my my kid like. I will sacrifice sleep. I will sacrifice my free time. I will sacrifice everything to make it so he is comfortable, to his make it so his needs are met. And I'm doing that because I love him and I he's part he's like half of me in a sense in a DNA mm-hmm. sense and and that's my own personal belief in that and I that's that's the drive and the why and the reasoning that I do that. Now, other people I don't want to put guns in people's faces to say that they have to do that same thing cuz that's right. not cool. That but- that's and, and it's important to understand, I think, that one society that fosters that sort of attitude yes. and approach will be far more successful than a society that does not. It's showing more value. And it just by the very fact that when you raise kids who peacefully, they're better attuned to the world. They make choices. They make better choices mm-hmm. in the world. So the point is... Not okay. Where should that arbitrary line be drawn? I think the answer is nowhere, and I think the mm. answer is more in respect to how society evolves to uh, treat children 
to give children the support that they need to develop successfully in life. I think, yeah, when you're four years old, you should be able to mm. say, yes, I consent to marry an 80-year-old. I think you have that right. But I think also that a society that allows you to do that without really gu trying to guide you in a more valuable life path, without trying to tell you, look, that's a really bad idea. Mm -hmm. That's a terrible mm -hmm. decision. Mm -hmm. I think that that society provides for less value expression uh, or rather, that society provides for more value expression than a society. Uh, I might have worded this wrong, but anyway, a <laughs> society that you yeah, yeah. I, I, you understand, right? A society that doesn't provide that support provides less value expression in its social evolution. So, so in a situation where you have old people marrying young people, people would just see it as a reputation based. Maybe they're not the sle the most uh, they're kind of a sleazy ish type person if they they're going to be marrying a younger person. Maybe the family that is married is I would I don't want to say allowing the person the young person to like there's obviously some something screwed up psychologically if you if you like a twenty year old wants to marry an eight year old like there might be some issues yeah that that are that are been caused possibly by you you're, you're being being it's raised dysfunctional as a kid. right it's yeah. dysfunctional and that's again where these where these market dysfunctions come from is they they well what 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 they result in rather is a, a lack of value it's simple yeah. it's really simple mm -hmm. so that's why I find, that's why I've been finding social darwinism to be kind of fascinating lately it's because it really helps to conceptualize how societies develop in an open market Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and again, remember I point out again, the path to an end is never a straight one. There, there are always good and bad scenarios and situations that crop up, but I don't think the answer to those bad and those bad scenarios is to centralize how we approach them. I think, I think the yeah. answer is to provide exactly. as much freedom as possible uh, so that people can take advantage of positive value opportunities. And one possibility would be, you know, again, the insurance company. If if you if your if your insurance company is going to give you uh, give your children uh, full adult rights in a sense at a certain age, that age will be determined by multiple companies figuring out what the best uh, what the best way to insure you is at a certain you know like yeah. the market's going to figure these things out. There might be an arbitrary age that that the market kind of determines possibly, be, yeah. But that if if that does happen, that is going to be based upon the market principles of why that that is happening right now. It's just 18 because school or, or 19 or 21 or, or <laughs> yeah, or 16 <laughs> or 14, depending on where you like for, for different reasons too. Yeah, like it, yeah. ugh, it's just ridiculous, right? There's so it's so arbitrary and also so inconsistent around mm -hmm. the world. Right. Mm -hmm. That's true too. Yeah. <laughs> it's nonsense. Um, I think, well, like, I don't know. Do you want to make this a full two and a half, like on the money? No, no, no. We got no. a couple minutes no. before to make it. To no, that. we should have, we should have ended okay. quite a while ago. So I'm just, I'm just thinking of syndication and, and the show being a full two and a half hour mark. Oh, uh, how many, <laughs> how many other shows, how many other shows I adhere know, to I the know, formatting I standards know. that we do for Liberty I Express? Know. Cause I, it's kind of funny, right? Like our show for, for the first hour, uh, well, I guess for the first, if you're listening to this on the RSS stream, it's like uh, fifty six uh, minutes ish. Fifty six, yeah, fifty. Or no, it's a little bit less now. Yeah, it's fifty four. No, I think it's six. I mean, fifty six. No, it's, 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 it should be fifty. Six minutes. and three. Uh, yeah. Was it three minutes? I thought it was it's, four minutes of. Or maybe it is four. Hmm. Anyway, um, ooh, I hope it's. I hope I have the right amount. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, okay, but the 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 like we 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 adhere to some pretty strict formatting. Apparently, strict. I don't know. Maybe Ed <laughs> adheres to strict formatting. Anyway, but but so many other podcasts out there, like they're going to be an hour and twenty minutes, or an hour mm -hmm. and eight minutes, mm -hmm. and uh, two hours and twenty three minutes, or it's like it is. It doesn't. It's, it's I know. Not a big deal. I was so. just trying to get one more story out of you, but oh, we're all good. <laughs> no, not happening. <laughs> All right. So I think uh, that's good enough. We're going to end off there. So thank you so much for listening. And uh, yeah, I guess, I don't know. I, I, oh, I, let us know about that feedback for your uh, Oh, yeah, the Bitcoin there. thing. I yeah. really do want to know about the Bitcoin, like the Bitcoin ATMs thing. I would really appreciate feedback on that. So feedback at edandethan.com is where you can send that. I will keep my eye out for it, and I really do appreciate it. Uh, if you want to visit edandethan.com, you'll get the latest updates, including that Bitcoin ATM article. Ooh. Uh, Twitter is uh, ed, uh, bleh, <laughs> at ed and Ethan, uh, Facebook, Ed and Ethan, all that good stuff. 
visit comic. Why don't you call more often? Visit, <laughs> really? Come on, we're lonely and bored. We, we don't have a live show <laughs> anymore, so you can't call us. Uh, but you can still uh, send us messages, and we will read your stuff. Yeah, you can't call us because. Thank, mm. thank you, by the way, too, for everyone who's been uh, sending us uh, some Bitcoin. We've got some Bitcoin recently uh, after announcing we were yeah. ending the show, and and all the good uh, com- uh, positive comments and stuff like that. And yeah, we're gonna talk Bitcoin here. So we're not going to not talk Bitcoin. That's right. So. We will talk Bitcoin from time to time mm-hmm. and all that good stuff. All right. Thanks a bunch for listening. This is Ed and Ethan.